Well, greetings. My name is James Emery White, and I am a pastor, professor, and former seminary president. And I have devoted much of my life to the study of the interplay between church and culture. I've written on the rise of the nuns, uh, Generation Z, and more, but nothing compares to what I've been researching of late, which is why we're offering this webinar an, an entirely new way of thinking about how to do church, a way of thinking that has been generated by seismic cultural change. You know, I've long been intrigued by an obscure passage in the Old Testament scriptures, almost a throwaway comment about a group of men within the people of Israel. They were known as the men of Issachar. We don't know that much about them. Issachar himself was the fifth son of Jacob and Leah, the ninth son overall for the patriarch. He had four sons and went with his father into Egypt, where he died and was buried. Afterward, his descendants formed one of the tribes of Israel. By the end of the wanderings of Israel through the Sinai Desert, they numbered over 60,000 fighting men. When the Promised Land was apportioned, the men of Issachar received 16 cities and their adjoining villages. Moses referred to them as a strong ass situated in a beautiful land. He meant it as a compliment. But what is most evident is that by the time of David, then numbering nearly 90,000, they were known supremely for their wisdom. It was even noted in the Talmud that the wisest members of the Sanhedrin came from the men of Issachar. But here's what intrigues me. It was the nature of their wisdom. In the first book of Chronicles, it tells us that from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders. And those men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. That's always intrigued me. They knew the signs of the times and how best to live in light of them. It's almost a theme verse for what I've tried to do with my life. To know the signs of the times is more than headlines and tweets. It's knowing what is significant among the happenings of our world, events and movements, trends and ideologies, currents and worldviews. It's knowing what is shaping us and forming us and molding us, but that's not all. The men of Issachar didn't simply know those signs, but knew how to then live in light of them. And I wanna talk about those two dynamics. First, what are the most important signs of our times? Well, there are many to choose from, but in relation to the mission of the church, I would argue that two are in the vanguard. First, that we now live in a post-Christian world, and second, that there has been a digital revolution. In other words, our mission field has changed, and the way we communicate to that mission field has changed. Let's talk about the new reality first of being a post-Christian world. There have only been three eras in relation to the Christian faith, pre-Christian, Christian, and now post-Christian. I think most of us have heard about the rise of the nuns. The nuns are the religiously unaffiliated. When asked about their religion or faith affiliation on various surveys and polls, they, they don't answer Baptist or Catholic or any other defined faith. They simply say, I'm nothing, or they check the box for none. When I first began researching and writing about the nuns, they made up one out of every five Americans, which made them, at that time, the second largest religious group in the United States, second only to Catholics. And not only that, but they were also the fastest growing religious group in the nation. In 2021, the percentage of Americans who self-designated as atheist, agnostic, or of no particular faith rose to 29% of all U.S. adults. That's nearly one out of every three adults. They are not simply living in and being shaped by a post-Christian cultural context, though. They don't even have the memory of the gospel. So that's first. That's our new mission field. The second sign of the times is that there has been a digital revolution, which has to do with the way we communicate, the way we reach out to our mission field. The speed by which this technological revolution has taken place is simply stunning. While baby boomers can't remember a world without TV and millennials can't remember a world without computers, Gen Z does not know a world without constant, immediate, and convenient access to the web. When Steve Jobs, announced the original iPhone as little more than a combination of three revolutionary projects, an iPod, phone, and internet connectivity, even he didn't know what had been unleashed. But make no mistake, the iPhone changed the world. I remember reading something Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman once wrote, and he simply titled it, What the Heck Happened in 2007? Only he didn't say heck. He makes the case that it was one of the most pivotal years in all of human history. And not just because that was the year the iPhone was released, but because of all it set in motion and all that came into play in a simultaneous way. Beyond the iPhone in 2007, Facebook left the campus and entered the wider world. Twitter was spun off. Google bought YouTube and launched Android. Amazon released the Kindle. Netflix started streaming videos. 
and the internet crossed 1 billion users worldwide, the tipping point to it becoming the fabric of our world, all in 2007. There really is a tale of two civilizations. One is physical and has developed over thousands of years. The other is virtual and it's just begun. So if those are the signs of the times, let's carry the lesson of the men of Issachar forward and also ask, how do we now live? What do we now need to do? Due to the new reality of a post-Christian world, coupled with the digital revolution, the church must respond by becoming something it has never been before. And here's why. First, because of the rise of the nuns and the post-Christian world in which we live, our mission field has changed entirely. And second, because of the digital revolution, our means of communicating to that mission field has changed entirely. The significance of this simply cannot be overstated. When you look at the cultural challenge facing the mission of the church, regardless of the era, there have always been two key dynamics at play. One is the nature of the mission field that we face, and the second is the nature of communication needed to reach that mission field. Imagine you were sent to reach an unreached people's group, such as the Sheikh of Bangladesh. You would first need to know something about the spiritual state of those people. What do they believe? What religious or supernatural beliefs do they currently hold? Has there been any exposure to the Christian faith? Understanding your mission field is understanding who it is you are trying to reach, economically, culturally, demographically, and especially spiritually. In this case, you would find yourself in South Asia, on the Bay of Bengal, the dominant religion of the sheikhs is Islam. Even knowing that small of a snapshot would tell you so many things you would need to know and do to prepare as a missionary, particularly in relation to their spiritual orientation. But that's not all. Then you would also need to learn how to communicate with them. You would need to learn their language, in this case, Bengali, and then convey the message of the Christian faith in a way that is both understandable and accessible. Now, Let's expand that idea beyond a particular group of people to an entire culture. What can be said of the West as a mission field in relation to the Christian faith? And how have we historically communicated with that culture? For example, is the climate Christian, anti-Christian, post-Christian? What is the spiritual context in which we're trying to operate? Is there a literacy and a background knowledge at hand, or is there illiteracy and ignorance? And what is the nature of the illiteracy and ignorance? Then we must ask how people communicate with each other within that climate, which is key because that will determine how we must communicate the gospel. Has our theology, much less our scriptures, even been translated into that language yet? I would contend that there have only been three main eras over the roughly 2,000-year history of the church in regard to spiritual context and communication. The first marked the beginning of the church. Following Pentecost, the early church faced a largely pagan culture that embodied pre-modern communication. What kind of church evolved to meet this challenge? Well, let's call it Church 1.0. Communication was almost entirely oral in nature. I mean, even when a letter from, say, the Apostle Paul arrived, the custom was to read it aloud to the gathered church. And evangelism was largely designed for Jews and Judaizing Gentiles and pagans. Then everything changed. The growth and influence of the Christian movement, particularly after the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine in 310, began to transform the West from a pagan culture to a Christian culture. But that wasn't the only thing that changed. So did communication, which evolved from mere language to writing, and then to the mechanization of writing. How did the church respond? How did it meet the challenge of not only a changed spiritual context, but new forms of communication? of going from persecuted minority to dominant cultural majority, and from a largely oral world to one of written and even mechanized words. Let's call it Church 2.0. Church 2.0 spanned a long section of Christian history, from the early Middle Ages through to the time known as the Enlightenment. While much change happened during that time, as any historian could tell you, one thing did not. The centrality of the church and the Christian faith. What this meant was that rather than contending for Christ in a marketplace of ideas, much less in the face of persecution, the Church of the West operated in a context of cultural dominance, if not outright control. As for communication, the scriptures were canonized and their propagation was confined to written language, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and eventually German and beyond. This meant that communication went from primarily oral to primarily written, And in terms of communication, it then became mechanized, 
which is why it should come as no surprise that the very first book off of Gutenberg's revolutionary printing press using movable type in 1454 was a Bible. We are now living in the midst of a seismic change as the culture of the West moves from Christian to post-Christian. And on the communication front, we have the shift from mechanized writing to electronic encoding. We are now living in a post-Christian digital world. What kind of church will meet the challenge of this new day? Well, let's call it Church 3.0. Church 3.0 is a church that embraces the new cultural terrain, one that is post-Christian, and the new way of communicating, which is digital. Knowing that you're trying to reach a post-Christian world, not pre-Christian or Christian, post-Christian, and knowing that you have to do it digitally will prove to be, and I know this is an overused term, but it fits, a paradigm shift of seismic proportions. This is only the third missional era in the 2,000-year history of the church. By missional era, I mean only the third type of mission field and only the third change in the nature of communicating to that mission field. This is the only time that's happened. We've had to navigate this in our 2,000-year history, only the third time. In terms of spiritual climate and the nature of communication, this is only the third great cultural revolution in light of our mission since the birth of the church. This is why I spent three years writing Hybrid Church, pulling together the latest things that I was researching and finding and and learning about this and this massive change in our culture and how it changes everything. Uh, The introduction to Church 3.0 and why during the upcoming Church and Culture Conference in September, an entirely online event, we'll explore even further how churches can pursue this. And by hybrid, I mean being a community of faith and being a church for the unchurched and simultaneously having a physical and a digital presence. And the need for this model wasn't created by COVID. Uh, We began moving to this model before COVID. It's just been accelerated by it. And at first, I think most churches did a good job adapting to it. Um, There were at least five ways that the pandemic early on held the potential of positively altering the trajectory of the church in ways desperately needed along the lines of our changing world. First, Churches were forced to move from a weekend-centric crowd approach to a a seven-day-a-week incarnational approach. While every church should embrace, celebrate, and promote corporate worship, too many churches made that celebration the end-all for the life of the church. We say that the church isn't bricks and mortar, but rather a community of faith that can be strategically served by bricks and mortar. Yet too many churches were never leaving the building. The goal of the church is to be the church in the community where it resides, attempting to reach and serve in the name of Jesus. Early on, the pandemic broke us out of our gospel ghettos and our holy huddles and got us into the neighborhoods and streets where we live. Second, churches were forced online. You would think the vast majority of churches were already online, but they weren't. I don't mean they didn't have a website. Most did. I mean they didn't have an online presence, an online strategy. They weren't thinking about that. Prior to the pandemic, having an online campus or even streaming a service on Facebook had been pursued by a very small fraction of the 45,000 or so Christian churches in the technologically advanced U.S., much less the wider world. But then, virtually overnight, the vast majority of churches did have an online presence. In other words, churches were finally going where the world actually lived. Third, churches were forced to embrace social media. If most churches did not have an online presence before the pandemic, it goes without saying they were not embracing or using social media. One study found that pre-pandemic, only 15% of churches in the U.S. were using Twitter or Instagram. Yet as churches had to quickly learn, social media is the communication network of the modern world. It's how people relate, get their news, feel relationally touched. In essence, the pandemic forced churches to learn to communicate the way the people they were trying to reach were communicating. Well, fourth, churches were forced to innovate and change. Necessity, it has been said, is the mother of invention. It's also the mother of change. When you're forced to stop doing things the way you have always done them, but have to find a way to soldier on, you're forced into new ways of thinking and new ways of acting. It's been quipped that the seven last words of a dying church have always been, we've never done it that way before. In the nick of time, at least for many churches, they were having to say, we must do things like never before. That takes a church from seven words before death to seven words before life. Well, finally, churches were brought back to mission. When all of your practices and ways of doing things are stripped away, you're left with something raw and unfiltered, your real reason to exist. When faced with 
say the inability to meet for a Sunday service. You're forced to ask yourself what you were trying to do through that Sunday service and then get about doing it. Well, just as we were finding our footing, just as we began making inroads we'd never made before, at the first opportunity to gather again in person, so many churches went right back to business as usual. I can't begin to tell you how many pastors and church leaders I heard express that the key to everything getting back to normal was going to be the ability to start meeting again. They said they hoped they would never hear the words Facebook streaming again for the rest of their lives. But then came the shock. People did not return in droves. Things didn't get back to normal. And the reason had little to do with the pandemic, which only provided the smokescreen. Churches had been seeing declining attendance for some time prior to that. Again, what the pandemic did was just accelerate and widen the effect of these two seismic cultural changes that hold enormous import for the life and mission of the church, the new reality of a post-Christian world and the digital revolution. This is the new normal. So here's the challenge. We have to rethink the church's approach to fulfilling its mission in light of a post-Christian digital age. And the heart of that rethinking hinges on a single word. And you've been hearing a lot about it lately because it is the word, hybrid. When we talk about a hybrid vehicle, we're talking about something that uses two or more distinct types of power, such as a submarine that uses diesel when surfaced and batteries when submerged, or a car that runs on gas and electricity. When we're talking about a hybrid church, you're talking about a church that is also harnessing two types of power, the physical and the digital. The digital revolution has taken place. There's just no going back. Churches will either embrace the new world, which means the new mission field and the new way of reaching it, or become obsolete, irrelevant, and completely out of touch with the world it's trying to reach. Churches will have to embrace the digital along with the physical. They'll have to go hybrid. As I mentioned, I was like most pastors. I expected a rush back to church after the COVID-19 pandemic shuttered the church's doors, and it didn't happen. It still hasn't happened in terms of in person. There are many reasons that have been suggested as to what, uh, why that has been the case. Uh, people still hesitant due to health concerns or departures over various cultural and political divides that erupted during that time, and nominal attenders drifting into a more settled, unchurched mode, but. There is another reason that receives too little attention. They like attending online as much, if not more, than in person, particularly when a church has an effective online presence and encourages people to attend and engage and connect in the manner they desire. I remember reading something Donna Hoffman from the George Washington School of Business once wrote. She said, we're facing a hybrid future. People have found convenience in some of these virtual options that just make sense, and they don't necessarily have anything to do with you know, being kept safe for the pandemic, even though they might have come of age during the pandemic. Here's the headline. We need to move away from a focus on gathering and move toward a focus on connecting. We have bet the farm on gathering people together in a building. That's a bet that just is not going to play out in the days to come. Instead, we need to invest in connecting people in whatever way they're willing to connect with us. And right now, and for the foreseeable future, that will be done digitally, even if that's just the starting point. And let's stretch our thinking. This doesn't mean we don't gather together. It's rethinking how we gather together and the very definition of gathering. It may not be physically in a building. Thousands gathered this past weekend at the church that I lead. They talked to each other. They engaged one another. They experienced a shared worship and teaching with each other. Phone numbers and emails were exchanged. Plans were made to connect over coffee. They gave of their resources. They prayed with and for one another. Pastors were pastoring. Counselors were counseling. People were giving their lives to Christ. It's just that most of it happened outside of a gathering in a building. It was through a community gathering through an online campus. But it still happened. And it was very, very real. Jesus clearly said, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. What he did not delineate is the manner of that coming together. I, I know this, this is mind stretching, but let's, let's let our minds be stretched. For example, think about the one another's, which are all through the Bible. It's interesting when you actually read them uh, and ask yourself, does that have to be face to face to be fulfilled? Surprisingly, the answer for almost all of them is no. And isn't the real challenge the introduction of authentic community into the world of physical people, whether that world be in person or online? 
Now, I know scripture says in Hebrews to not give up meeting together. I've heard that whipped out so many times that worship has to be in person and that anything online is somehow bad. But that passage actually has nothing to do with worship. It's even been called one of the great urban legends of the Bible. It was talking about uh, not gathering physically for corporate worship or actually gathering physically for any church event. In Hebrews 10, where that passage comes from, the author is speaking directly about not giving up on relationships, not giving up on people. It was a clarion call to the need for strategic relationships. Corporate worship was not the context or the subject. It was all about the importance of Christians spurring one another on, encouraging one another to not give up on doing that in the context of a world that demands perseverance. In fact, in the phrase, not give up meeting together, the Greek word translated give up speaks of desertion and abandonment. In other words, don't abandon each other relationally. You need each other's support. And I can support and encourage someone virtually as well as physically, unless obviously their need is a physical one. This is just a new normal. There's no going back. There has been a digital revolution, which means there's no going back from the necessary online engagement that was accelerated during the pandemic regarding the church. I remember reading a cable news report, and in it, the person being interviewed said that church as we know it for the past few generations is just over. Every church you've ever attended or that you drive by on your way to a Sunday sporting event was built on a physical attendance model that is location-centric. And as a result, church leaders and pastors have spent time every week encouraging, inviting, pleading with people to come to a specific place at a specific time on Sundays. This approach has created church staffing models and systems and ministry strategies focused on improving attendance. That's why there's an annual top 100 list of America's most attended churches. But he ended, that way of doing church is dead. Well, I'm not prepared to say it's dead. Uh, people, though, will naturally vacillate between online and in-person offerings, between the virtual and the physical. From this point on, feeling that either of the two options are not only acceptable, but equal in terms of counting as having attended. This is just, just one aspect of the hybrid model that churches must begin to think about and pursue and embrace. It's not about whether churches should be in-person or online. The answer is yes to both. It's just not gonna prove helpful to elevate in-person attendance over and against online attendance, much less shame online attenders. The better and more strategic path is to embrace any and all engagement. As my friend Kerry Newhoff has written, the hybrid church model will simply become church. In other words, hosting church online and in person is just how you do church to reach the next generation. People have lived in the slipstream of digital and in real life for well over a decade now. And church leaders will realize that church online is both a necessity and an opportunity. You know, it's good that the debate, he writes, over online church is going to fade into the background because then leaders can get on with the key task, reaching people however they come, in person or online. The goal, obviously, is to become omni-channel, allowing individuals to connect online and offline seamlessly. Or as Dave Anderson has written, an omni-channel approach to church would allow people to fully connect and engage with the church without the need to step inside a physical environment every week. They could attend one Sunday, listen to the message on podcast the following week, watch a live online stream the Sunday after, catch the message on demand in a church app the week after that. And he notes that this shifts the church from a location-centric approach to an audience-centric approach that allows people to connect and engage with churches both digitally and physically. In essence, think being a multi-site church. Only now what that means is that you have two primary campuses, one that is physical and one that is digital. Again, we're going to unpack this a lot more now this actually can play itself out in a church through the upcoming Church and Culture Conference which will focus almost entirely on the practical development of a hybrid model for any church of any size. So we're gonna be looking at things like how do you have a, an approach to discipleship in a hybrid model where you have online things, the way education and seminaries are moving. How does that work for a church? We're gonna be looking at the six step hybrid strategy that MEC follows and that any church can follow that has led, at least for us, to a 40% increase in attendance just over the last year. And it's been much more than that over the last three. 
We'll walk you through the six-step strategy that we follow. We're also going to be looking at how do you actually craft an online campus service, putting that together, and what's different between an online service and an in-person service. So a lot of things that we're going to be unpacking as well as looking at some other cultural issues. But anyway, I hope you'll join us if you want to go deeper on this and really learn how to apply this to your church. But we want every church to thoughtfully engage the digital tools at their disposal for the sake of the evangelistic cause. Because it is simply a fact that most, if not all of the church's initial contact with the lost world will be digital in nature. We've got to use these mediums as a bridge over which to cross in order to connect with our world in order to call them back to God. And there's obviously a difference between being a thoughtless adopter and a cultural missionary. But make no mistake, I'm arguing for being a cultural missionary and our mission field has changed dramatically. And this can be done thoughtfully. It can be done biblically. As one author suggested, if one response is enthusiastic and uncritical embrace, and a second calls for complete strict separation, consider a third way, that of a thinking Christian employing disciplined discernment. So at least let's do away with the glib remarks that you can't do church digitally. The goal is not to transform the church into a solely digital form, but to transform the church's thinking and methods and strategies in order to reach a post-Christian world. And this will necessarily involve taking full advantage of the digital revolution. We've got to embrace a hybrid model of ministry that involves the digital and the physical because that's the reality of our world. The truth for many churches is that we've done things in a certain way for so long that we may not even realize that the very definition of places and things, even what it means to be in human community, has changed. There's a new translation that we have to make. It's time to let new technology spark another reformation. Or as Thomas Friedman once quipped, when asked if God was in cyberspace, he said no, but he wants to be there. You know, I've devoted much of my life, as I said, to the study of the interplay between church and culture. And I've written on the rise of the nuns and Generation Z and so much more, but as I said, nothing compares to what I've spent the last three years researching and writing about, resulting in the most bleeding edge book on church and culture that I've been able to produce in my lifetime. Because what has happened is that our mission field has changed entirely, and our means of communicating to that mission field has changed entirely. This is only the third time in church history that this has taken place. Our mission field has gone from pre-Christian to Christian to now post-Christian, and the way we communicate has gone from oral to written to now digital. We now live in a post-Christian digital world, and there's no going back. And this calls for an entirely new approach to not only reaching our world, but doing church. And again, there's a name for this model. It's called hybrid. And that's why the full title of the book was Hybrid Church, Rethinking the Church for a Post-Christian Digital Age. And I hope you'll read it. And I hope you'll also join us for the upcoming Church and Culture Conference that will explore how to apply it to your setting. Now, I know that hearing about a digital revolution and a new church model for doing church can feel overwhelming. I understand. I'm 61 years old, which means I'm not exactly a digital native. I was still using a typewriter when I started graduate school, and only during my PhD years did a word processor become a part of my life. Shortly after I planted the church I have now led for more than 30 years back in 1992, I recall one of our staff begging me to think about using something that she said was email for our correspondence. At the time, it sounded absolutely absurd, and I would have none of it. But I adapted and embraced, and I'm so glad, because the mission matters. A mission that's filled with real people, with real names, with real families, with real eternities. And I can't imagine a better way to end our time together than with one of those very real people. And with her permission, let me read you what she posted on Instagram uh, a while back. She says, as I was watching the online campus of Mecklenburg Community Church and their reflection on this past year, I was reflecting on how much Mech had impacted and influenced my life in the three short years that I've been attending. Because of Mech, my husband and I have become Christians. Because of Mech, my husband and I were baptized. Because of Mech, my marriage has been strengthened. Because of Mech, my gift and passion that he gave me for dancing has been used to serve him. Because of Mech, I'm discovering and transforming into the woman God made me to be. I am so proud and incredibly grateful to call Mech my church home. And I know God will continue to strengthen and transform me through the church to further his mission. Thank you. And again, this is from someone who joins us through our online campus. That was a life that was changed. And because we did everything we could to reach out to her, 
including going hybrid. Thanks for listening, and I hope this time has served you and that the book and the upcoming conference will as well. Blessings.